Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the MMA slate for uh, April 16th. From a quality perspective, from what uh, I'm gathering, it's not exactly top-notch, um, but there's still an incredibly huge uh, DraftKings slate, paying six figures for first, and we're going to attack it. The other thing that's very, very uh, interesting about this slate is there aren't a lot of... Uh, extremely strong inside the distance props. Um, so I think that finishes are going to be very uh, tough to come by, which means that you're really looking for a couple of things. I mean, you're looking for wins, you know, even more so than normal. And also you are looking for a grappling upside because, you know, in the absence of a lot of finishing upside, you know, grappling upside is the next best thing. Um, the other thing I would mention is that there aren't any, like I call them mathematical locks. In other words, there's no uh, canceled fights with replacements, things like that. So it's just basically a very straight, straight up MMA card. And, you know, I've looked through this quite a bit and I think I can uh, provide some value and give you some insight onto some of these fights and how, at least how I'm going to probably uh, attack it. So we're going back and forth between the DraftKings app and the and UFC best fight odds. Um, cause that's where we're going to derive the inside the distance props and things like that. Um, so I want to start with the main event here. So the main event, Luke gave Baham up against Bilal Muhammad. This is always where you kind of have to start because, you know, when you have five rounds to work with, it just provides an incredible floor. Um, in addition, it, it, it raises the ceiling as well for some of these guys. So, you know, until DraftKings you know, changes the, the algorithm to account for these five round fights, this is really where you have to start. Now, the only thing is, is first of all, these main events are usually really highly owned as a result of it. So you have to determine whether the ownership is going to be worth it. And usually that is a function of the remainder of the slate. Uh, for example, if you have a slate which is just loaded with with high upside finish uh, finish candidates, maybe you can make a decent argument to fade the main event. But when you have slates that are just you're just a lot of bad inside the distance props and things like that, um, then it becomes very very difficult to fade. However, this slate is kind of in the middle because first of all, from a from a sheer volume perspective, I mean having fourteen fights you know, the math of it just dictates that there's a couple that are just going to finish. It's just that's the way it works. You know, if all these fights are about, you know, on average, maybe, you know, plus 130 or plus 140, I mean, you, 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 you span that out over 12 fights, you're probably going to get at least four finishes, maybe more. So, you know, that, that's one thing that, that will, you know, that argues for possibly fading the main event. Um, the other thing, is that there are some fights here that do have some degree of grappling upside. So uh, even if you don't get finishes out of these other fights, it's possible that you get enough, you know, get enough going points wise to, to have the main event faded. One of the issues though with fading this main event is, is the various win conditions. First of all, the pricing is very, you know, very nice, you know, 85, 7,700. It's very, you know, fits the, the actual win odds. But the thing is, is that the win condition of the underdog is extremely conducive to, to high upside uh, you know, DraftKings scoring. You know, if Bilal Muhammad wins, it's most likely going to be because he was able to get takedowns on Luque. So that is that's that condition makes this main event a very very difficult fate. Um, and Luque, likewise, I mean, he he has a lot of volume, you know, and when you, when you guy that has a lot of volume and some finishing upside, you give that type of condition five rounds to work with boy, oh boy. I mean, that's, that's a, it's a tough spot. So I do like the main event and I would, I would not lean one way or the other. I mean, I would, I would really try to get 50% of each of them because while obviously, you know, Luke, a, you know, rates to win more often, Muhammad, I mean, he's almost guaranteed a strong, strong score um, if he wins. Um, so I would actually say both of them are going to get a big scores if they win. But I would actually 
prefer, if you had to pick one, I think Muhammad is more secure in his score. You know, I think there are paths where Luke, I don't know, how does he win a decision here? And I guess he could win a decision in, in that, in maybe getting taken down two or, you know, two or three of the rounds and then just doing enough striking rise, those other three to grind out a decision. And in that scenario, maybe, but maybe Luke only scores 80 points or something like that. And, and bus, um, where Muhammad, I mean, if he wins, it's just, it's just, he's just going to be, he's just going to have an incredible sport, 7,700. So I would really go 50% uh, either of uh, both sides there. Let's, uh, how do I want to do this? I guess we can go fight by fight, but I want to start actually with what I think are kind of the best plays. How about that? So Sabatini against Laramie. So this is one where you don't have a strong inside of distance prop. And the reason why, I mean, it's not bad. It's minus 130. Um, but it's not, it's not obviously something that you'd like to see in a minus 500 favorite um, at 9,200. But first of all, minus 500 is, is more a $9,400 price tag. And the only reason maybe it's 9,200 is because the algorithm is pricing in this, you know, this, this fight doesn't go to the decision line, which isn't that great. But what the algorithm is failing to price in is the fact that Sabatini is an insane wrestler and he's an insane chain wrestler, which means that, you know, he's going to take you down and God forbid you get up, he's going to take you down again. And he just is going to rack up DraftKings points. So, you know, the, the combination of his style plus the five to one win odds, this is, I mean, this would be the first guy, if I were hand building, just make sure that I have. I mean, this is in a card which is kind of like starving for big upside, I think this is really where you start. Um, I wouldn't say I would lock him in, but to fade him is really, really difficult. I mean, conceptually. I mean, like it's, it's got so much upside at that, uh, you know, for even for 9,200. So um, I guess that's where I would start. Um, and, and the next one I want to look at from a... Um, uh, from a numbers perspective, is this Barnett Boudet fight? Because this is the only one that really has this huge inside the distance prop. Fight doesn't go to decision minus like 600 or something like that. So uh, you have Boudet at 9,000 9, or something. You have Barnett at 7,200 or 9,200, 7,000. Let's just double check that just to make this right. Um, 7,200, 9,000. I mean, this is when you have one inside the distance line that just squashes the other ones, you probably want to try to get that. And, and Barnett, is he a good punt at 7,200? I mean, you're going to love this guy when you see him. He's like 5'9", 500 million pounds. And for his size, he's extremely athletic. You'll see him do all these spinning back kicks. I don't know how he gets himself off the ground, but I guess there's a world where he connects on Boudet, but I'm not, I'm not, I don't think I'm doing that. Um, I think Boudet and Sabatini, given again the context of the slate, you, you want look if you can get them both in, great. Um, but at the very least, you should probably have one of them in in most of your lineups. I mean, I, I guess we'll now go through fight by fight. Um, actually, let's 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 cherry pick this a little bit. Let, let, let's 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 talk about the fights I like here. So. I don't know why, but I, I, I want to start with this uh, uh, Omar Giezev against Barajo fight, which is the co-main event. So again, this is this has a fight doesn't go to decision line, which is not the worst at minus 150. And you have Omar, Omar Gaziev, who is apparently a, a really good Russian wrestler, which is somebody that you really want to target normally in with DraftKings scoring. And the thing is, I've heard a lot of talk this week about what a smart fighter Barajo is. And Barajo is probably a, a decent live dog. Um, so if that's the case and people are going to play him, I think that playing Omar Gaziev is, is probably a really, really good idea. Um, you know, he's only 8,400. And the thing is, with Barajo, if he wins, I don't think he scores that well, being kind of a pure striker. Um, 
it, it's good. Obviously, if you get a win at what's his price, bro, 7,800, that's not bad. But if I'm just going for win equity, I prefer a little, uh, prefer to be a little cheaper. You know, if I'm going to play a 7,800 guy as an underdog, I probably want a little more upside than that. So I think that from a combination of just style, Omar Gaziev and maybe some leverage, I think that he's a very, very strong play as well. Uh, I guess we're going to move down the card a little bit. Baeza Fialo. This is another uh, uh, semi-strong inside the distance prop, and I think this is the end of them. So this is minus 175. And I want to break this down a little bit because, again, I like to fade too much of the consensus if the numbers don't back it up. And I've heard a lot about Fialo having that KO upside in this fight and being a good punt play. So I want to look at the numbers here a little bit. And I do see, I, I'm sorry, I still see that Baez is inside the distance prop. His win by KO is just stronger than Fiala. Usually when you have a situation where you have an underdog that people like as kind of like have that KO upside, it's because his, you know, that his KO upside relative to his price is that much better than, than his opponent. But here it's just, it's very similar, you know? I will say that Fialo probably has more first round KO upside than Baez. I guess so that's fair. Um, but I'm not going to take a stand or anything like that if Fialo being a good underdog. If anything, again, I, th I think Baez is a good little middling place at 8,700, you know? So, so I definitely like that. Uh, Buena Silva against Wu. Um, this is one that I can fade. See, this is a minus 500 favorite, but, you know, fight doesn't go decision line is poor. The, well, is it poor? Yeah, I mean, it's sort of poor for that price. And she doesn't really have that much grappling upside. So at 9,300, it just, it, it just, it's very, very difficult to get to her on the slate. So she's probably not going to. As, as the guy from Rotor says, she's probably going to get the X button, so to speak. And I'm not going to go for Wu Yunnan. I mean, I'm just 500, plus 500 favorite, no thanks. So again, we'll move down the card here a little bit. Uh, so Ang Lusa against Munir Lizetz. All right. So the, the thing that's interesting about this fight is this. First of all, from a numbers perspective, let's see what we got. We have fight doesn't go to decision line, not that great. Uh, grappling upside, I, I've heard mixed things. I'm not exactly sure where that lies here. But the one thing I will say is that this fight was added just at the last, you know, uh, well, it wasn't, the fight wasn't added at the last minute, but the, the pricing was added just the last minute. And I found that those fights usually tend to be underanalyzed, um, which means they tend to be somewhat lower owned. So, if you want to play um, uh, Lazez Lusa, I think that which whoever you play is probably going to be a uh, probably going to be a, a uh, you probably get a decent ownership break. Um, so that's 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 all I'll say about this is that I have no real opinion on the fight, but um, I think you'll get low ownership, so you do want to sprinkle these in if in fact you know you're going to get I don't know uh, if in fact you're playing multiple lineups. And Lusa, particularly, you know, in, in a in a slate where you need you need value. I mean, you always need value, but where so far no underdog has really shown out. Um, you know, as opposed to uh, what's his name, uh, Barajo, who probably doesn't score that well when he wins, but he's seventy eight hundred. Lusa, even if she doesn't score that well when she wins, she's only seventy four hundred. So her win is going to take a lot. Is going to do a lot more for you, not to mention the fact that um, she's going to be much lower owned. So I'm going to put this in here just, just to remind myself. Okay, uh, another kind of style fight I want to talk about uh, as we get down the card here. Is it up to him, this one yet? Um, yeah, so Devin Clark against William Knight. Uh, fight doesn't go to decision line is kind of poor. But Devin Clark has all the grappling upside from what I've heard. Um, so, 
you know, his win condition is extremely strong. When he scores, I mean, I think that, look, it's going to be tough for him to take down William Knight. William Knight's a big heavyweight and stuff. But if, in fact, and he does win, probably going to be because he was able to take him down. So if at 8,600, I think it's, again, a very, very strong play. I think it's very similar to the Omar Gaziev play. So it's Clark, Omar Gaziev. I mean, these are, I think these are both high upside style driven, you know, price supported type plays. I like both those a lot. And William Knight, I don't think I'm going to, I don't think I'm going to have him at all. Um, but, but, but let's stay a little William Knight for just a second, because whenever you have a 7,600 guy, you want to look at it. You got Knight winning by TKO plus 350. I mean, that's, that's okay. And maybe he's worth a stab. And maybe Devin Clark comes in for the takedown and just gets clipped. I mean, it's, it's possible. Maybe that's okay. I mean, maybe Knight is a better play than, say, than say Lusa, right? Because Knight at least has some KO upside where Lusa really doesn't. So, yeah, I actually, I, I agree with that. So, I actually do think Knight is, is, a, is a decent underdog at 7,400. Just because when he wins, he's, he's I mean, he's not winning a decision. He, he's going to score. So, I actually do like that. Uh, Landsberg, Kianza, um, Kianza, very poor inside the distance prop for her DraftKings price. It's minus 300 to go to decision, and she is priced at about uh 9,100, so that is not going to be for me. And Lena Landsberg is is 40 and doesn't have a lot of lot in the tank, and I'm just not going to play her. All right, moving down, uh. Jenkins against Drakkar Close. So this is the highest projected play on the slate from a median projection standpoint. You have a $9,400 guy who is a, you know, seven to one favorite. Okay. The, the thing is, though, is that the inside the distance prop is not great. I mean, it's basically a pick them to, to, to finish. And Close is not a real high volume guy either. So if, 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 I mean, if this goes to decision, which it happens 50% of the time, I mean, this busts, I mean, I think, um, I mean, not only that, but not only that, but, uh, um, sorry, not only that, but, but, even if he knocks him out and K the second round, I think that's going to be, that might not be enough either at 9,400. So um, I'm probably going to end up fading close. I just think that those other nine, nine K, I think Sabatini and, and, and Boudet, it just has a lot more upside for those prices. So if close gets the KO in the first round, I'm probably going to be in trouble, but that, that's what that is. Okay. Um, this next one, I, I want to talk about this because I find this type of fight interesting. Not fight, this type of analysis in general interesting. So you have Bronson, Bons, Bronson and Garcia at about a pick em. And the one thing I will say is that everybody is really sure about who's going to win. Um, I, don't, I don't quite get it. I mean, the people that like Bronson really like Bronson. And the people that like Garcia really like Garcia. There's nobody that, that say, I'm just not even sure. I, I don't know what to do. And so what that indicates to me is that this is a really strong fight for DFS purposes because I feel as though someone's going to be right by a lot, you know? Either Ron, So Ronson is coming up a two-year layoff after testing positive for steroids. And Garcia has been staying active, you know, kind of improving against kind of fishy opponents maybe. And I think that if either, if, if either fighter wins – by a lot, it won't be a surprise. You know, you'll be able to understand why. Like Ronson, if you if you watch like Dog or Pass podcast, I mean, they, they give a really good summary of why Ronson is basically a lock here. Um, and you know, it, it's if, if you listen to it, you'll totally believe it. I mean, and then on the other hand, you got other people with with just incredible confidence that this that the two year layoff is is hopeless for Ronson and Garcia is just going to take him down and grapple him and kill him. So this is the perfect fight for me. I'm taking both sides of this. I mean, I have no idea what's going to happen, 
but I think it's a really strong fight to target. Um, okay, we're down to three more fights here. Sorry, this is going longer than I was expecting. Actually, it's not. So Jordan Levitt against Trey Ogden. So this one is an okay inside the distance prop. And the issue though is, is this, like Jordan Levitt, I don't think a decision is in his range of outcomes. I mean, he's like basically a submission or bust guy. So you have an inside the distance prop of about pick him and he's about pick him. So that means about 25% of the time I, I would deduce like he gets a submission. Let's just take a look at see if that's uh, if that plays out here. Yeah, there it is. Levitt wins by submission, about plus 350. Makes sense. And then you get Ogden wins by submission, about plus 275. So Ogden is probably the stronger, the stronger play here. And the odds pretty much suggest that. The, the reason why I would give the edge to Ogden is, and the projections are probably going to going to uh, reflect this is that Ogden is more likely number one to get takedowns and number two more likely to inflict some damage on the ground you know and, and pick up those you know those strikes on the ground where Levitt is going to be hunting for submissions pretty much um if Levitt doesn't submit him I mean he's not going to score at all I don't think and uh so I think that Ogden's upside is just a little bit higher than Levitt so I do like this fight, but I prefer the Ogden side. All right, uh, Nunez versus Sam Hughes. Uh, no thanks. Fight does a good decision, minus 250. Not a lot of takedowns for me. Uh, I'm gonna pass on this one. And the first fight of the night, Haile Alatang versus Kevin Groom. Um, so this is gonna be my, you know, my take, I guess, or just, this is really not justified by the numbers, but let's just, you know, let's look at the numbers anyway. So Alatang minus 170, Kroom plus 150. Inside the distance prop, about a pick him like most of these fights. And from a pricing perspective, you have, you have Kroom a little undervalued, I think, right? Because Kroom is 7,400, only plus 150. Alatang is 8,800, only plus 170. So I do think Kroom is a, that's a little bit of win equity value. The other thing is that uh, he does have a little more volume. I would say a lot more volume than Alatang. I think Alatang's path to victory is probably wrestling, but there's been some discussion of whether he really knows that <laughs> and whether he's going to go for that. And the thing that kind of trumps all of this is that if he does go for takedowns, I mean, Kroon is um, a, a James Krause trained guy. And as we've talked about since I've been starting to do these videos, I mean, James Krause is an extremely good trainer. Um, and he's extremely good with the with the with the train with the with the wrestling as well. So I think he's gonna have Kroon prepared for that. So you give me look on, on a slate with, with where you don't have a lot of great underdogs, give me James Krause's guys at 7,400 um, with with possible upside with volume and stuff. And I think that, I think that that's worth a shot. So I guess to summarize, um, I, I feel as though the underdogs that are in play for me, at least are going to be Chrome. It's going to be William Knight. Uh, it's going to be obviously Muhammad from the main event and probably some Fialo, but those are probably the underdogs I'll probably attack. Or I'll play. And then the favorites, you know, the 9Ks, I'm probably going to fade close. I'm probably going to play 17. I'll play the um, the Boudet. And then those mid-range grapplers, I think, are really strong. You know, the the, the other one, the uh, the Russian, whatever his name was, uh, Omar Garmaziev. I think that's his name. Um, and that Garcia Ronson fight, I think, is really worth worth targeting, as is this Ogden Levitt fight. So yeah, I did give you a lot to go, a lot to work with, but you'll see when you start building lineups, and you you can't really play as much as I as I let you as I wanted you to play. You'll see, you'll see when you build your lineups what you get drawn to. But if you start with that framework, I think you're going to be off to a good start. All right, that'll do it. Good luck, everybody, and. Uh, uh, happy holidays for whatever holidays you guys are celebrating this week.